Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to another Molecular Devices Cellular Imaging Webinar. Uh, today, the topic is the application of high content analysis tools for antibody uh, drug discovery. Again, thanks for, thanks for attending. Uh, for those uh, who may uh, be viewing the screen but not have audio or if there's any issues during the call, um, this is a uh, WebEx technical support number. Uh, or I will go through uh, how you can send a Q&A either to us or to uh, the WebEx assist who is on, uh, on, on call. So uh, any time during the webinar, please uh, submit uh, your question. Uh, press on the Q&A button uh, on the toolbar to expand the Q&A window. Type in a question. Choose all panelists, so we will all see it. Uh, press the send button. And again, if there's, uh, you may want to note that phone number down if there's any issues during the call. Okay. So the agenda is, um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Richard Chandy, the product manager for cellular imaging at Molecular Devices. And I'll be doing a little introduction on the Image Express Hypon screening systems as well as our software that supports that product. Uh, and we are uh, very privileged to have with us um, uh, Julian Andre, um, who um, got his PhD at NYU, um, but for the last 13 years has been working in the pharmaceutical industry, first at Merck Serono, then at Sanofi, and now he's at Regeneron, and that's where we're learning, learning how he uses uh, APA tools for animal drug discovery. And then at the end, uh, we'll uh, save some time for a Q&A uh, &A session that I'll compile your questions as they come in, and I will ask them of Julian. So a little bit about uh, molecular devices. We offer a complete suite of imaging solutions. From uh, the top left would be the MTSF Micro, which Julian uses, for, which is a wide field icon and screening system. We also have the MTSF Image Express Ultra, which is a confocal icon and screening system. We have software tools to bring in third-party image, imaging uh, images into our uh, database. These two, all these products are tied together with a data management solution called NDC Store, and that helps uh, that that helps make uh, a seamless interface uh, once you've acquired the images to analyze them with MetaExpress or a high throughput uh, software option MetaExpress PowerCore, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second. Additionally. Uh, Acute Express is um, a tool that allows for uh, hit selection and higher level analysis. And all of these things uh, are seamlessly integrated. So just a little bit, but some of the, when you talk to customers about the challenges being encountered today, we find that Hikon and Screening Labs have a pressure to acquire more screens. Uh, there's a huge application space that needs to be addressed. Julian's going to go to three or four examples that he, he uh, needed for his uh, drug discovery work. And, you know, wait time for screen resolution and Q QA needs to be cut down. And there's also this additional need to integrate with existing imaging modalities, which I'm not going to speak to that much. So, a little bit about the wide field system, the Image Access Micro. So, the new system, the Image Access Micro XL, was an improvement on our, our, our uh, uh, sort of workhorse, the Image Access Micro. Uh, the, the improvements are um, sort of a larger field of view, and what you see here is the 4X objective uh, imposed uh, field of view uh, imposed on a 3D4 well, and this will be from a standard uh, imaging system. And with the XL, you can capture off of that, that whole 3D4 well in one image. So what that does is drive down the number of objects on single field of view so that you can uh, get the statistics you need. Alternatively, if you need to do some low-resolution low, low imaging, you can capture that one thing for well with one image with a 4X objective, which I've shown you. And so when we have large objects like you right, you can also collect less images uh, to, to get that data you need. The Inpexus Micro as well was originally launched with a you know, solid-state light source for on-demand illumination, eliminating mechanical uh, shutter failures, and reducing the support requirements. Recently, we've uh, added to the portfolio with other long-life light sources that give some flexibility to address a variety of other applications, including 
uh, UV, near IR, radiometric imaging, and fast excitation, excitation switching. So there's a whole portfolio of, of light sources that help uh, the image express micro XL system be flexible. But it's not just about the field of view and the light source. Okay. The, we use a FCMOS detector that has good and C log dynamic range, really ensuring that you see your signal. This is a, a transfer assay seeing very small, bright uh, dots on top of a fluorescent haze. And with the new system, it's quite, um, quite easy to see, and you'll see some of that data uh, uh, that Julian uh, uses um, with antibodies. So next is it's not just about the images, it's what you, what you do with the images, and I'm going to go through a little bit about um, MedExpress and MedExpress PowerPoint. So there's hundreds of applications patients that are enabled with high content screening tools. We like to say we address it from apoptosis, from A to Z, from apoptosis to zebrafish. And on the list is, is just some examples of those. But how do you make sense of that? And we also find that there's a huge analysis continuing um, with needing increasing flexibility and complexity. As, as assets are more complex, you need more flexible tools. So the analysis continuum starts with a Four applications meaning of turnkey, these application modules. Uh, I will explain those to you, and Julian uses that quite uh, quite extensively. Um, and then at the other stream is some type of uh, you know powerful uh, uh, macros to be able to customize uh, customize analysis. And what we've recently come up with is something in between that bridges the gap between the turnkey and the co complete scripting, and that's something we call custom modules. And I will uh, uh, go through that. Um, uh, explaining what a custom module is. But once a custom module is uh, created, what's nice about it is they now become standard application modules that you don't need to customize. You can make them once and reuse them and share them. So a little bit about uh, the standard application modules. So these are sort of canned, walk-away automation. Uh, there are some advanced segmentation feature detection tools built into them. Uh, you can get side-by-side and cell-by-cell data, sort of validate the results. We're seeing here a sort of scoring module where this this uh, blue nuclei is scored red because it's very little cytosolic marker, and this other nuclei is scored green because it's in the presence of a, uh, it's a nuclei associated with the cytosol with some intensity into it. And now these these, these application modules they can, but you can uh, customize with journal for 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 addressing your needs. Uh, all, all application modules sort of share the same basic controls. There's a simple configuration where you select the wavelength or the image that needs to be processed. You set a range uh, of object size. You set, set an intensity above a local background. Um, this helps with uh, if there's uneven illumination or other samples in, in, in the background. Uh, you can test and save and then run it across multiple plates. And the, the, the modules automatically split touching, uh, touching cells. A little bit about uh, custom modules. This is much newer, and Julian's not, I don't believe, is um, uh, using any, any of these in his, in his talk. Um, you can analyze uh, much more than you can with, uh, with the modules or, uh, or with journals. But what's nice about it is they're a simple interface. Uh, you can segment bright field space contrast images. There's ways to bring morphometric classifiers, shape analysis. You can find objects within objects, and here we're showing finding functional uh, associated near nuclei or even on, on neurites. Um, once created, they can be shared. They're easy to modify. Uh, they can be run on our parallel processing uh, tool, MedExpress Powerful, just like the modules can. And once you save them, it's a simple addition to the database. So here's an example of a, uh, you know, a label free image that now is quite easy to segment with the tools in, um, in the custom module. Uh, that's a sort of a unified intuitive interface to be able to choose uh, uh, the GUI interface rather than a scripting language uh, where you, you choose your tools that you want to uh, use, finding objects, uh, modifying objects, modifying images. As you choose those tools, steps in the module are displayed as discrete cards. Those cards, once created, now you just have to look at the module, you just have to change those numbers in there. Um, you don't need to go create new cards. And then you see what's happening to your image down below in a film strip. 
Um, so this is step-by-step -step segmentation. So it's not just about running that uh, across a single place. You now need to run this across many places. Um, and we need, we, there's a, it can be an analysis bottleneck with many of the ACS products. So um, there's a MetExpress software option. It's compatible with custom and turnkey modules. Uh, it, the goal is to drive analysis and faster and image acquisition. And you just need to license the power that you need. So here's a, a graph of analysis time uh, with the number of parallel processes that are being running. And somewhere between 4 and 15 cores, you're significantly faster than acquisition. Um, and you can uh, keep up with that. So this, this tool is MedExpress PowerCore, and it, it helps with, uh, with, with that screening workflow. So uh, now uh, with MedExpress 5.1, I didn't talk a little, that much about 5.1, but 5.1 brings these same, to, same tools I've mentioned to uh, time-lapse analysis, um, not just for, for uh, endpoint screens. Uh, we're trying to drive for tools that believe alleviate the screening day-to-day uh, -day challenges of ACS, to will run more screens, have an expanding set of applications that can be addressed, uh, in, in, in increase the speed of uh, hit selection, maintain quality images, and integrate with existing imaging modalities. So on that note, I would like to turn the talk over uh, to uh, Julian Andre from um, Regeneron, uh, who's going to tell us how he uses these tools uh, for animal drug discovery. you see my screen? I do. Okay. Hello, everybody. I would like to thank you for joining us today. And I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar, specifically Gerisha Chandy, for giving me an opportunity to tell you how molecular devices tools are being applied for antibody drug discovery at Regenium. <clears throat> my presentation will be divided into a few parts. In the introduction, I'll show you where high content analysis fits into a general drug discovery process. Then I'll describe in detail microscopy-based cell adhesion spreading assay that we developed for oncology. I will switch then to our ADC program, where MedExpress cell cycle and proliferation assay modules prove to be very useful, as well as some other imaging tools and quantitative localization journal we developed in-house. I'll end up with some conclusions from this work. Let me introduce Regeneron. Regeneron is growing New York-based biotech company with approximately 2K employees. Technology has always been at the core of R&D at Regeneron. Initially, Velocigen allowed generating low-cost genetically engineered mice. Then, successful application of trap technology resulted in our first drugs on the market, and that is our Calis, Pylea, and Zaltra. Recently, the Lossinian platform brought about an increase in the speed and efficiency for the generation of fully human therapeutic antibodies for multiple targets. That is when it became obvious that to filter this increasing number of antibody candidates, we need physiologically relevant cellular models, and we need to implement high content analysis technology. Over the past three years, that I've been with the company, we built a platform consisting of uh, Image Express Micro XL, this transmitted light and environmental chamber. Second, the XM, this thermo CRS robotic arm. We use Meta Express and also Columbus software, and all of them are linked to MD Store database. So let me now uh, jump right into our first functional assay that we have developed for oncology, and this is a vision spreading assay. Well, regulation of cell attachment and spreading is central to a number of pathological processes, including cancer cell metastasis, inflammation, and pathological angiogenesis. Adhesion spreading assay is measuring time-dependent increase in the number of adhered cells, and that is adhesion, and increase of cytoplasm area of adhered cells, which is spreading, those which were seated on particular extracellular metrics. You can visualize spreading by observing uh, cells losing refractivity in transmitted light, but you can also stain cytoplasm and measuring increase in cytoplasm 
area of cell spread, as we see on the lower panel. That second approach became the principle of our assay. Here, for example, on the upper panel, we can see a time course of adhesion and spreading of human cells over three hours. Hewitt, by the way, is human and clinical weighing in the telial cells. First, the primary cells. First, single round cells attached to the plate. Then you can see an increase in their cytoplasm area. You can measure adhesion as a number of cells attached to the plate at a given time on the left panel down, and spreading as a mean cytoplasm area per cell. And that gives you a nice and robust assay with very good Z factor. Let's go now and look into some nitty-gritty of the image acquisition and analysis for this assay. You use two wells per treatment, 96 wells. Plate can be used, which are pre-coded, and you can use thick bottom plates. You do image magnification at 10x, which allows very speedy acquisition of the whole well. Image-based focusing is done on Trinity channel, which allows for um, always in focus cytoplasm stain with fluid in treats. The usage of Ixanex cell increases the field of view by three times, and this is sufficient to cover the whole well very fast. Application of image ex express micro Excel sufficiently reduces the duration of image acquisition. In addition, the application of multi level cell scoring allowed to accurately segment nuclei, even on high background, which produced as a result of first staining, and we see it on the lower left panel. And also the segmentation of the cytoplasm with MWCS was very accurate. On this slide, I would like to show you how we applied the essay in a project involving some surface targets for metastasis and oncology. Measuring tumor cell adhesion and spreading on specific extracellular marker is a functional assay of integrins. And extracellular marker lamina 5 is a major component of basal membrane. And its main receptor, alpha 3 is a 1 integrin, plays a key role in migration and invasion of certain tumors. So, um, <clears throat> as you see, we used alpha-3 beta-1 antibody to validate adhesion and spreading assay of A5 from 9 cells on laminum 5. On the lower panel, the functional alpha-3 beta-1 antibody effectively inhibited both processes, both adhesion and spreading, confirming that adhesion and spreading of A5 from 9 cells are alpha-3 alpha beta-1 integrin dependent process. But uh, the question comes to mind, is microscopy-based assay ideal for measuring self-spreading, especially in the screening mode? There is, there is an alternative assay you can think about. That can be, for example, label-free label technology like EPIC, which might have potential advantage. Well, EPIC, the principle of the technology is based on the fact that dynamic mass redistribution within the cell, but the index of refraction changes and that results in valence shift. So spreading, for example, is one event which causes the shift of refraction index. We actually managed to measure spreading of A5 from 9 cells from laminin 5 coated plates and validate the assay using anti-integrin antibody. Uh, but uh, let's now compare the two technologies. In this table, you compare a microscopy-based approach with EPIC. So I extend the result of cell number and cell area. In the EPIC, the result is a little bit more obscure. It's refraction index change, which measures quite a few things. If I extend, technology is imaging and requires processing, and EPIC is label-free. Uh, EPIC is a continuous measurement method, which is an advantage. But XM has tissue culture into better environment, while EPIC assays have to be done at room temperature. The throughput of EPIC is a little bit higher. Both technologies can be applied to screen supernatums, which is especially important for, for us as an antibody company that increases our throughput. And finally, the processes which are being measured in XM is adhesion and spreading, while in EPIC is only spreading. Finally, and probably the most important thing, that the robustness of the assay with XM 
it was much higher than this epic. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, so our conclusion was that the functional assay IXM division spreading is preferred over epic based on the fa factor of robustness. Now let me switch gears a little bit and talk about another problem that we have here. And um, and that is um, uh, a very popular approach in the biologic drug discovery now it's called ADC, or antibody drug conjugate. The goal here is to enhance the, the therapeutic action of an antibody by conjugating a toxin to it. Antibody toxin conjugate finds its target on the cancer cells, getting internalized into endosomes and subsequently lysosomes, where the antibody is getting degraded. The toxin then diffuses into cytoplasm, causing cell cycle arrest and apoptosis in the cell, and also in neighboring cells, which is caused by standard effects. This is the theory. But let's look a little bit into the, how this approach is being applied in practice and which assays, we, especially uh, imaging assays, we can use to, to measure the effects of ABC in vitro. One assay, which is probably in most demand for ABC programs, is your everyday proliferation assay. Our assays for cell ATP and metabolic activity are predominant tool in this area. They're cheap, fast, and robust. However, as uh, shown nicely by John Moffat from Genentech at CHI 2012, a content analysis nuclear counting would be actually a matter of choice if it was not so time consuming. To overcome this obstacle, we use one step fixation permeabilization staining procedure by adding pure phase saponin first to the medium to cells for 20 minutes and then washing once and acquiring whole well images on XMX cell at 10x. Then uh, images are analyzed using proliferation HT module by MetaExpress. One step no washing staining procedure gives you excellent segmentation of this proliferation HT module, even if nuclei are closely localized to each other and you see on the, on the right panel. Another thing is the low acquisition time times with the XM cell, and uh, in addition to that, uh, this, this method provides also cell cycle information, which is critical in ADC projects. As I mentioned previously, most toxins used for conjugation in uh, ADC projects are binding tubulin and cause cell cycle arrest at early mitosis. When you test your ADC in vitro and subsequently in vivo, we want to make sure that cell cycle arrest is indeed happening in a toxin-dependent manner in the cell culture to confirm mode of action. The most reliable way of measuring cell cycle arrest would be by DNA content and by full cytometry because of a high number of cells analyzed. Now, Express, on the other hand, has a cell cycle module which is claimed to reliably identify the yield cells at different stages of cell cycle based on DNA density or mitotic specific staining. Well, indeed, as you see on the, on the right panel, treatment of cells with toxin induced nuclear arrest in prometaphase stage, as identified by first and mitotic specific staining. But uh, how the quantitation of this data from the whole well will look like? On the next uh, slide, you see that MetaExpress software allows for graphic representation of cell cycle data collected from one well. As you see on the upper panel, toxin conjugates of antibody 1 and 2 induce clear cell cycle arrest in G2M stage, contrary to unconjugated or controlled, which is non-binding antibody. The number of cells analyzed is quite high, ranking from 30 to 50 K, which is quite comparable to the length number analyzed by flow cytometry. So it's a good matter. The next question is how do you know quantum cell cycle data correlates with specific mitotic stain data as detected with cell cycle module? On this slide, I compare a mitotic arrest dose response with two antibody toxin conjugates measured 
using is a DNA average intensity on the left uh, panel or mitosis specific staining on the right panel. All of data of Sassel is here quite comparable and indicate that antibody toxin conjugate is more important in inducing mitotic arrest in a dose dependent manner. Uh, the, the, the conjugate 2 is more important than uh, antibody toxin conjugate 1. Well, I hope I can move to you that both meta-express proliferation and key and cell cycle modules come in really handy in analyzing effects of ABC in vitro. In the next few slides, I'll introduce a couple of more tools developed for mechanistic studies of ABC motorfaction and its trafficking inside the cell. But first, let's have a look at the lymphocytic pathways and different approaches one can take to study them. There are different gateways into cancer cells. It can be micropenocytosis, clattering, and non non-clattering mediated endocytosis, and so on. In many cases, when antibody binds to a target which internalizes through clattering mediated endocytosis, it goes first into early endosomes, and then it recycles back to the surface, or alternatively goes to lysosomes for degradation. We remember that toxins should be cleaved from an antibody or antibody should be degraded in lysosomes for toxins to diffuse in the cytoplasm, bind to tubulin, and induce cell cycle arrest. For ABC program, any ABC program, it's important to study intercellular trafficking of corresponding antibody. And this would allow to answer quite a few or approach quite a few key questions. For example, for a given linker toxin pair, Will internalization of an ABC into particular vesicular compartments, for instance lysosomes, be a predictor of inhibitory efficacy? Which aspects of compartment internalization are important for cell care? Needed percent occupancy, total amount of ABC into compartment, and so on. Another question, can you get by with lower expression levels of the target if you have efficient internalization um, into cells and lysosomes? The cell vesicles, especially lysosome, have considerably lower pH than outside the cell, and that allows to use pH-sensitive probes to identify intracellular compartments. The recently labeled ligands, like transferrin, will help highlight recycling pathways, and there are also sensitive antibodies recognizing compartment-specific endogenous proteins. On this slide, I listed uh, pretty much all tools that we uh, use in our everyday work to study intracellular trafficking. We use, as I said, pH sensitive probes like pH RODO. pH RODO can actually uh, can be conjugated to antibodies, and um, we also like other markers which are pH sensitive, like uh, Clydesdale sensor blue. We use extensive, extensively bacillomycin A1. A small molecule inhibitor of VATPAs. It um, evens the intravesicular pH and eliminating lysosomes, but not affecting very much recycling pathway. We also use fluorescently labeled transferrin, as I said, but we also use the markers like LAMP1 and EA1, also markers of lysosomes and endosomes, respectively, and um, we can use them for endogenous staining. And on the software side, we have MetaExpress Transfer module, which we trusted for identifying vesicles. And we have a colocalization journal to measure degree of overlap between different types of vesicles. So in the next few slides, I'll show a typical series of experiments, which uh, where by using these imaging tools, we identify, for example, that lysosomal processing is being essential for cytotoxicity of certain ABCs. First, at this slide, we show that bacillomycin A1, which selectively inhibits the ATPAs, it blocks, um, actually, it's doing its job, so it blocks the pH of vesicles. Here, in this slide, cells were labeled with lysosensor blue, the small molecule which has the labeled lysosome. And then bacillomycin was added to the upper panel, upper row, for a time zero. And you see how the staining disappears 
So basically, all pH vesicles disappear, and after one hour, as we see on, on the lower panel, there is no staining with lysosensor sensor blue. So botulomycin A1 and one micromolar completely eliminates all low pH vesicles. On the next slide, uh, to answer yourself, uh, stable cell lines of tonight's cells are expressing certain targets. We are treated with monoclonal antibody conjugated to alexafluor or monoclonal antibody conjugated to pH shortle for 24 hours with or without bacillomycin. As you can see, elimination of lysosomes with bacillomycin inhibited uh, antibody pH shortle fluorescence, but not alexafluor fluorescence, which is localized in the vesicles. You can see it on the left, uh, left panel. And that further confirms the mode of action of bacillomycin. It inhibits lysosomes, eliminates lysosomal vesicles, but, but does not prevent internalization. And on the next experiment, you see that 293 cells overexpressing targets X were treated with toxin, monoclonal antibody toxin, or control antibody conjugated for toxin for 24 hours to be the result bacillomycin. Cell were fixed, stained with HERS, and we stained with mitotic stain to, to analyze the cell cycle. On the left panel, you see that bacillomycin treatment completely abrogated cell cycle arrest used by antibody toxin conjugates, very much at all concentrations tested. And that indicates in itself that lysosomal processing is required to induce cell cycle arrest by this particular antibody under consideration. So that's pretty much how we use our tools to, to study intracellular trafficking of ABCs. Now, let me switch a little bit to yet another approach to study ABC trafficking, and that is direct visualization and sensitization of binding and internalization of antibodies. As you see from this slide, we have different methods in house to approach binding and internalization. I would focus today on colocalization of fluorescently labeled antibodies with intracellular markers. First, we need to identify antibody and marker vesicles in the cell. Usually, vesicle area in cell has high local background, as you see on the upper panel, and that's where adaptive acquisition background feature of non-expressed transfer module comes in really handy. In our experience, transferor module is perfectly, perfectly suitable for segmentation of vesicles. When it comes to quantitation, you may need both area and intensity measurement output of transferor module. On this slide, you see typical internalization time course of fluorescently labeled antibody in tumor cells. Over time, surface staining on the left is transformed into spotty structures inside the cell, but also the intensity of staining increases as antibody accumulate inside the cell. Now, instead of just measuring accumulation of antibody vesicles over time, let's try to see if we can detect an accumulation of vesicles in certain intracellular compartments. The workflow of this analysis done through a journal we have written in house, and um, I'm going to talk about it a little later. But first, let's let's try to apply a just transfer module to quantitate our vesicles. You see on this slide that over time, uh, both total integrated intensity and total area of identified vesicles increases, and that reflects what what you see what you saw visually on the previous image. Now, how we will do our colocalization? Here you have a workflow of how our colocalization module actually functions. First, antibody image is segmented with transfer module to identify antibody vesicles. Then all signal is subtracted from original antibody image except for antibody vesicles. Second, intracellular marker image is segmented with transfer module to identify marker vesicles. 
and they are all signal subcharts of some original marker image, except for marker basic And uh, in the final step, there is an overlap area of antibody and marker vesicles, and that's usually calculated as a percentage of area. Now, uh, let's consider the following scenario when we, when we try to look at these percentages. Say we have five antibody vesicles forming near cell surface. Inside the cell, there are nine marker vesicles. Eventually, only three antibody and marker vesicles to localize. Numerically, it means is that percent area of antibody over marker will be three out of five or 60 percent, while percent area of marker over, over antibody will be three out of nine, which is 33 percent. So those are two different measurements that should be taken separately. Keeping this in mind, let's look at the actual data. Here we have internalization time course of an antibody expressed as a percent localization with early, with the early endosomal marker EE1 or lysosomal marker lens 1. On the upper panel, you see that already 15 minutes after addition, the antibody is accumulating in early endosomes, while accumulation in the lysosomes starts later in time. You see it on the lower panel. That is in accordance with internalization route of clashing coated pits, which is shown on the right to remind you, where internalized vesicles accumulate first in early endosomes, then in lysosomes. Another interesting point here is that up to 40% of lysosomal compartment is occupied by internalized antibody after four hours, while only 12% of antibody reside there indicating that there is a lot of antibody vesicles that do not get to lysosomes for some reason and go somewhere else. Well, um, um, high content analysis for me always meant uh, high information analysis. Here in the co-localization assay, we have only two outputs, but uh, already quite a lot of information for us to consider. So uh, let's look at this result. We have antibody 1 to target 1 and antibody 2 to target 2. We follow their internalization in the same tumor cells, knowing that lysosomal processing is essential for cytotoxicity and used by corresponding ABC. To find in one case, we find in one case that high percent of lysosomal compartment is occupied by antibody 1, but only a small percent of it goes there while more than 50% of antibody 2 on the right panel is in lysosomes, but occupy only a small percent of the compartment. So the question to us, I'm going to leave you with, is which antibody is going to make a better ABC? Okay. So um, I, I'm going to finish my talk now, and uh, let me just uh, um, finish with some conclusions. Oncology problem, we have established and validated robust imaging-based cell adhesion and spreading ESC for primary cells and tumor cell lines with these factors well above 0 0.5. The assay allows to measure the effects of purified antibodies as well as hypergoma soups from morphological outcomes of if and induced integrin mediated signaling. We have shown clear advantages of accent-based spreading assay over apical label free technology. For our enhanced ABC program, we combine a um, cell killing assay, detailed DNA content analysis, and those dependent evaluation of mitotic arrays induced by antibody toxin conjugate. We have established and validated imaging tools to study intracellular trafficking of antibodies, and um, we apply small molecule lysosomal inhibitor and cell cycle measurements to demonstrate that ABC induced cell cycle rest require lysosomal processing for some ABCs. We have shown that meta express transfer module allows to acquire quantification of vesicular structures, and transfer, transfer based localization journal allows to quantitate time dependent accumulation of fluorescently labeled antibodies in intracellular compartments. Overall, I think molecular devices imaging solutions emerge as important tools in establishing individual functional assay oncology 
as well as the status of antibody trafficking for EDC programs. Finally, I want to acknowledge as my managers, EP of Oncology and Therapeutic Programs, and my way who did most of the work. And thank you for thank you for listening. Julian, thanks very much. A very interesting uh, uh, talk. Um, I will uh, please uh, please submit any questions. I'm going to uh, just uh, pull up uh, a slide to remind the attendees about how to submit questions. Take a moment to display. Um, and I apologize for the little waffle uh, in the middle of the screen, but that's where I will uh, view the questions that you send me. Uh, I'll move it uh, down there. Um, so yeah, so just as a reminder, if you have a question, please press on the Q&A button at the top uh, toolbar, type in a question, choose all panelists, uh, press the send button. Um, I have a couple of questions um, for, for Julian. Um, one is, uh, you talked about uh, DNA average intensity and mitosis specific staining of three dots for the cell cycle. Are these, these two different out, uh, outputs interchangeable, or is there one readout that you prefer? Well, in some cases it can be interchangeable, but the, our preferred result is mitotic specific staining, especially for difficult cell cultures where nuclei are not easily distinguishable and uh, and segmentation is not 100% correct. Uh, so uh, mitotic specific staining always worked better for us. We're actually now uh, developing a CME module, which would allow us to work with those difficult cells to really separate the nuclei and count them. And then we use mitotic specific staining to, to count nuclei arrested in mitosis. Okay. And, uh, you know, you showed that the, in one of the slides you showed the, uh, you know, the uh, endocytosis into either EEA1 or LAMP1 positive uh, vesicles. Um, wouldn't you have expected uh, first to see a rise in the early endosomal uh, uh, phase that then de declines? That seem to be pretty static as they moved, as the antibodies moved on to lysosomes. What, what was, um, what's that about? Yeah. Thanks for that. It's, it's, it's a very good question. It's uh, actually slide 28 here. So what happens here, I didn't describe the experimental design for this experiment, but actually antibodies in this experiment are being constantly supplied to cells. It's not a pulse case experiment. Therefore, once the antibody enters the cell and, and starts co-localizing with intracellular compartment, there is kind of constant flow of internalizing antibody, and they stay in this compartment. Therefore, we are just monitoring the, the first phases of, of internalization. And uh, as you see there on that slide, you first have accumulation in E1 and it stays there as antibody constantly being supplied. And then there is a delayed accumulation in lysosomal compartment that also stay, stays uh, constant. So that's um, because the experimental design was such. Got it. Uh, have you, so you're using your pH sensor dyes. Have you looked at, um, uh, looking at the rate of endosomal acidification? I guess the, 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 the question I asked because uh, the rates can be variable and, and you could be sorting away from the lysos uh, lysosome, not just into the lysosome. That's correct, and, and uh, pH order is, is a marker of uh, acidic vesicles and not only lysosomes. Therefore, we, we don't necessarily solely rely on pH order or, or any pH uh, label to, to identify lysosomes as a lysosomal compartment. We usually use a few metals, and, uh, and that's why I, I described, in addition to pH order, I described also, collateralization of your recently labeled antibodies with intracellular markers are actually metals which may be sometimes more precise in identifying lysosomes as a compartment. However, pH, pH order is, is definitely very convenient. You can conjugate them to antibody 
and then you can monitor the internalization rate over time and, and, and do transportation relatively easy. So, so it's convenient, but it's not a uh, not very precise method. Got it, got it. Um, uh, haven't seen any other questions come in. Um, I, I obviously you had a, you gave a very clear talk. I will let uh, just wait one more minute to see if anybody else has uh, a question. Okay, we're still taking questions. I'm going to move on to uh, a thank you slide, but I'm I'm monitoring the the question uh, that that will waffle there is the question uh, box. Um, okay, so um, really appreciate you attending. Really thank uh, Julian for um, uh, for uh, giving uh, a very interesting talk. Um, his email is on the screen. If you have uh, additional questions on on uh, the subject matter he spoke on. Uh, I do have, I see a question that's come in. I'll uh, ask in a minute. If you want to uh, talk to me about uh, a product question or presenting your own work, uh, that'd be great. My email is up at grisha.shandyatmoldev.com. Uh, we have information on our website at uh, highsuperimaging.com. This webinar, as well as past webinars, is posted to uh, molecularvices.com slash webinars. And um, there's a forum that we've set up. It's, we're, we're leveraging the Metamorph uh, forum. Uh, uh, so there's a place that is shared journals and custom modules if you want to speak to other um, um, uh, others. So uh, the question that was asked was, why did you compare HCS with label free? What, what was that? Uh, why did you choose that other uh, modality to compare to? Yeah, the, the Epic technology label free technology is um, is running in 384 well played. So as I mentioned before, we are interested in screening uh, super netons. They are coming in uh, hundreds, basically. And um, and uh, it would be convenient to screen them in 384 well format. And, and that's why we developed the essay also for EPIC. Uh, and, and we compared them with, with imaging based essay. Uh, and, and there were sometimes correlations, but many times there, there were not. So, um, so that was the reason we, we turned to Epic at all. We wanted to increase the throughput of our adhesion spreading assay and uh, make it um, continuous. Right? That would allow us potentially to, to use longer times and so forth. Uh, two, uh, two ten, uh, one welder, sir, but really appreciate your talk. Um, again, um, uh, one more minute uh, to monitor. Oh. How easy is it to quantitate the pH roto in an APS format? Okay, so um, it's, it's relatively easy. pH roto is, um, is very good. Um, Guide has um, is practically non-fluorescent at neutral pH, so your background is minimal, and is it accumulates in cells. It uh, it can give you pretty bright staining in in low pH vesicles. So you can what you can do is you can actually collect all the vesicles and then measure intensity in them, and the higher intensity. The vesicle is going to be the, the lower pH of that vesicle will be. So, so among different metals, it's probably the easiest. The caveat of this metal is that you are taking all low pH vesicles, not necessarily lysosomes. If that's what uh, what's okay for your project, uh, then then that would be the method of choice. Okay, then uh, back to the epic question. I I think I know the answer to this, but I'll ask it of you anyway. Can you perform the HCS in the epic plate? Can you perform an HCS in an epic plate? Yeah. I, um, think, yeah. I think. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you know what you mean. So, so in the epic, the variability between wells is quite high, and if you see, uh, uh, yeah, on slide nine, the standard deviation there. Of control and, and antibody treated cells is, is higher than in the imaging based assay. So we use something like eight wells per treatment, 
And, and sometimes you get uh, quite high variability. And variability wasn't actually another problem that we had to deal with, with EPIC. So um, I think EPIC would be good for some short-living events, like, for example, translocation of some molecule within the cell. I know it's been used for GPCR activation, you know, for subsidized and kind of activation. Then EPIC response there is, is well defined. If you can add the response, which, which you don't know what it is, if you can add this response to, to some biological process that you know about, then I think you can you can use it in a high con high content screen uh, for for short living events like receptor activation. I, I I think he means can you actually image the uh, the, the 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 epic plate on the micro on on any uh, yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, you can you can take epic plate and image it. We did that. Okay. I hope uh, the person asking that question. I hope that 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 answers the question. I think you're asking. Uh, I just did not. Yeah, you, you can definitely you can definitely take an epic plate and an image it of an image express micro, and then you can compare your epic results. At least the final point of of, uh, of measurement with with whatever imaging results you're gonna have. Yeah, looks like we answered looks like we answered the question for the for the speaker. Okay. Um, the next, so then the next question is: Have you multiplex labeled the epic labeled thing with HCS and some that you have, right? Sounds like you did some comparison. We, we did some comparison. And uh, and they were comparable. I mean, that's how we actually realized that what we are measuring is epic is spreading because we saw we, we took at the plate we saw spreading actually happen there by microscopy and and we could measure the the increase in, in cell index so those two things correlated got it got it okay um all right so one more time here the uh the contact information uh and more information uh, within one or two days, this uh, whole webinar will be posted to um, the MolecularAdvisor.com ACS webinars page. Uh, please contact either me or um, Julian uh, directly, respectively, about our various expertise. Um, and uh, thank you, Julian, again for um, for speaking. Thank you very much. Yep. Julian, just stay on the call for a minute, and we will go into a private session and. Thanks all for attending.